I would like to talk to you this morning about something you've probably never heard. In 30 years of ministry, I've heard maybe one or two sermons about this topic in that entire time. Probably because our first impression is what Jordan gave me this morning when he saw the message. He goes, oh no, this looks like it's going to be painful. The Bible says that this a topic will affect every believer. The judgment seat of Christ. What is it? Much of what we hear today, it's rooted in what I'm going to tell you this morning. I, I read a, a book of John Bevere's called Driven to Eternally. Literally, it has changed his life, but it's literally changed my life because I think there's something that God wants to show us in this judgment seat that maybe we've never heard before. I don't want you to be confused today with the great white throne judgment that the Bible talks about when... When the the unjust or the, the, the ungodly will be judged. The judgment seat of Christ is for those who are believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 and 5 it says, My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. If it is the Lord who judges me, therefore judge not before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At, each, at that time each will receive their praise from God. Many times I've heard pastors talk about this portion of scripture and they use it in re relationship to, to the lost with salvation. But really it's obvious from the context that he's talking, Paul is talking about believers here. He's talking about a judgment that is to come. He's talking to the church at Corinth and, he's, and he tells them at the very end there, he says at that time each shall receive their praise from God. There will be no praise at the white throne judgment. But at the judgment seat of Christ... There will be praise. Greg, why do you keep us thinking about eternity? Every week it seems like you bombard us with, with eternal per principles. But what I want you to understand is the enemy is, wants to bombard you. The world wants to give you its perspective. Everything you do, everything you encounter, everything you deal with is aimed at focusing you away from eternity. The enemy wants you to focus on the now. Because he wants you to know, because the Bible talks about this not being our home, but this place that he's going to give us rewards one day. There's too much emphasis, I believe, in the church today on the now, when the Bible really talks about the emphasis being for the future. People who have an eternal perspective have went through much in this life. They've suffered much loss in this life, yet they've gained an eternal perspective of life. I think about Francis Chan, who lost both of his parents at a young age, but, his, but, the, but the part of the perspective that he has of life. If I can use Tracy, the perspective she has on life is an eternal perspective. Losing your mom, losing your husband. See, it puts us in a whole different category when we've had that loss, when we've experienced that loss, and we realize that really everything is rooted not in this life, but in eternity. Francis Chan said last week in that one, a couple weeks ago in that video, he talks about that two-fifths of a second of life. That's really how long our life is in comparison to eternity. It's nothing. It's so brief. It's such a vapor. God has things beyond for us what we can even think or imagine. In 1 Corinthians 2.9 it says, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. This week, Jordan and I and Greg... Went to the lake real early in the morning, and it was, we had one of those perfect glassy lakes, you know, where you want to go ski, and it just, it was so much fun, it was enjoyable to see that lake looking like that, and, and to be able to enjoy it, and there was no one else out there, it was like, it was like it was our lake. See, God wants us to understand the beauty of the mountains and their splendor, everything we love about this, this life. I want you to think about this heaven. 
has a crystal clear river that flows from the throne of God. Emeralds and onyx and amethyst, topaz and pure gold adorn the city. No darkness. The presence of God will be our light. We will gasp at the beauty and the splendor. We will see something so beautiful and then the next thing we will see will astound us even more. No pain, no worry, no decay, no sadness. We will feel good. Your bodies will feel good. Your back is going to feel good. The food will be endless. The banquets, the feasts, the weddings like we have never seen before. We will see more clearly. We talk about this life as a haze, a mist. We will understand with greater measure an endless reservoir of fascination. Never bored, always intrigued, always amazed. See, I think sometimes we get this picture of heaven is these angels with harps running around and this white white place that that it doesn't look like any fun. It's going to be boring. It is not going to be boring. Everything you enjoy about this life, other than sin, God is going to have it in heaven. What he created here is is not even a glimpse. It's going to be a thousand times better in heaven. Streets paved with gold. See, we get disappointed here. We won't there. We suffer loss here. We won't there. See, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, Jesus tells us this in Matthew 6, 19. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on heaven where moss and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moss and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. See, I want this morning to rethink, to recalibrate our minds about rewards of God. I told you I'm gonna, we're relaunching the book Driven by Eternity. I have to say, of all the books that I've written, all 19 books, no book has impacted me more than any book personally as I was writing it. It literally rocked my life, changed my life forever. And um, I had something occur in Brazil about nine months ago, last December. I went down to Brazil and I was asked to speak to a leadership meeting and I remember flying down to a city called Goiânia, Brazil. And they said, we want you to just speak to our pastors and leaders. It will be pastors and leaders only. So they drive me to the arena and I walk in and there's 12,500 pastors and leaders in their church network. And this whole arena is packed. And they are like rocking the house with praise and worship. I mean, the roof is going boom, boom, boom from the way they are dancing and singing and going after Jesus. And I thought, wow, these people are on fire. Preaching to them that night was a piece of cake. Okay, it was like you can't preach in this atmosphere. You need to leave the ministry. So um, the next day I'm at lunch with like eight of the top leaders of the whole church network. And I'm talking to these guys at lunch. And I said, okay. How many people do you have in your churches? All your churches. First of all, they told me how many hundreds of churches they had. I said, well, how many people are in your churches? And they said, well, we have over 300,000 people in our churches. I thought, wow, that's significant. I said, well, when did this all begin? They said, well, it all began with one family in 1999. Yeah, that's what I said. And I sat there and I said, what? Do you mean to tell me that 16 years ago, one family started this network and now you have over 300,000 people? They said, yeah. I said, okay, please enlighten me. How do you build a church of over 300,000 people in 16 years in a first world nation? Now, I thought I knew their response. I thought the answer to this question, they're going to say it's because of our home groups, our home fellowship groups. And without even batting an eye, without even hesitating... The leader who spoke the best English looked at me and he said, it's because we teach our people on eternal rewards and judgment. And I went, what? He said, you Americans, he said, John, now this guy spoke very good English. He said, I've preached a lot in America. I've noticed Americans don't talk about the judgment seat of Christ. And he said, so American Christians, they have a 70 or 80 year perspective. He said, our believers, we have an eternal perspective. And when you have an eternal perspective, you live differently. 
You make decisions differently. You endure things that you wouldn't necessarily endure if you have a 70 or 80 year perspective. You pursue things differently. C.S. Lewis affirms this. He wrote in Mere Christianity. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next world. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. I want us to get an eternal perspective. Because I truly believe if we have an eternal perspective, if I told you that the next 24 hours, how you lived in 24 hours would affect eternity, I bet you would live differently. And reality is in relation to eternity, our life is so brief. If we would live our lives as though eternity mattered and as though the rewards that God has for us are worthy of that, it would change the way we live. It would change the way we affect people's lives around us. See, in our enthusiasm for God's grace, especially when we bring up a word like judgment... I don't want to diminish God's grace in any way, but I want you to understand this morning. I've heard TV preachers say, He will never judge you. He's going to judge us. Put judgment behind you. There's coming a day when believers will be judged. I want to give you a quick example of how... And I'm going to use a TV preacher as an example here real quickly. I was getting ready to do a, a message on communion. And I heard, I got this scripture in Psalms 105, the TV preacher talked about, he says, it brought them up out, brought them also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among the tribes. And the, the, the TV preacher had said, this is why God brings us out. They had went and, and celebrated Passover, and there was none of them that were sick. And I thought to myself, as I read it, I was like, that sounds good. I like it. I'm going to use that at church. But I, before I did it, I thought, I'm just going to look at a couple different translations. The NIV, he brought them up out of Israel, laden with silver and gold, and among them there was no one faltered. The New American Standard says then he brought them up out with silver and gold, and among his tribes there was not one who stumbled. It's like, Lord, is, were you talking about healing there, or were you talking about... That they, they were able to, and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, it's a miracle that they didn't stumble. But I want you to see how the world's perspective always wants to bring us back into the now and how it's going to be so good for me. The actual Hebrew word, and this TV preacher, he knows this, is kashal, and it means to stumble, stagger, or totter. It doesn't mean to be healed. I want us as believers. Something as simple as when somebody tells us something, going to a different translation to make sure. Listen, in 1611, the way they spoke in King James Version English is not the same way we talk today. So God wants us to be diligent. He wants us to be ready. He wants us to be ready for what He's got for us. If He's your Savior, then one day you are going to stand before Him. But Greg, I'm under grace. I didn't think I would be judged. Well, let's go to the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. And we're going to start there. I'm going to read in context. Therefore, we are also confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. He's talking to Christians, not the unsaved. He's talking to the church at Corinth. The unsaved won't be with God, for one thing. When they die, they are immediately taken away from God's presence. The next verse in 7 and 8, he says, For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now, once again, we hear this quoted a lot of times about faith teachers. But the context is eternal faith. The context is not just faith for this moment. It's not just about this. 
this home. It's about my eternal home. The next verse he goes into in verse 9, he says there, he says, so we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Our goal, the word goal there means to aspire for what is honorable. It refers to pursuing, devoting to oneself for that personal, great personal value. It means I am zealous, I'm eager, I strive, I'm, I desire very strongly. So we make it our desire, we make it our, our strong desire, our goal to please Him, whether we at home in the body or away from it. That is our goal in life, to please Him. It's not to please me, it's not to please yourself, it's to please Him. Why? The next verse says this in verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The Greek word is bima. So that each of us may receive what is due for us, the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. This is for believers. The judgment seat, it's used 12 times in the Bible. And it's not used once in the book of Revelation. It's properly, it's a platform. It was uncovered in Corinth. A place where they would walk up and receive rewards where they were giving out for the performance they had done in the Olympic style events that they held. I want you to know this morning, God is big on rewards. And He's big on expectations. God is big on rewards. I think that this is a part that we have missed as Christians. This is not an isolated teaching. Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 16, 27. He says, for the Son of Man is going to come with His Father's glory, with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. In the book of Revelation, speaking of Jesus, it says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. I will give each person according to what they have done. Because Christian circles today, we avoid the word judgment. This actually is scary to us. Sounds harsh or condemning. But if you look at the actual Greek word for judgment here, it means this. Crema, decision resulting from an investigation. A thorough examination. That's what we're going to have. A decision resulting from an investigation in our lives. God will judge the thoughts, the, the motives of our heart. He will make an ex a thorough examination of us. Confusion has come when we compare examination and His love. Let me say this about His love. We cannot do anything to make God love us more. We cannot do anything to make God love us less. His love is constant. You cannot, it doesn't matter what you've done in life. His love remains the same for you. He is not going to love you more because you do something else. But I will tell you this this morning. He, we are in charge of how pleased He is with us. Remember that verse I just spoke of. He says, so we make it our goal to please Him. Whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Our goal is to please Him. His love stays the same. It's constant. I want you to think this morning, think about this. If you sent your kids to college, you paid expensive tuition, you expect them to get a good education so they can have a good job for the rest of their life. Not to just sit there. You've picked up the expense. You don't want them to waste it. They're not there to party, get pregnant, drunk, or horse around. You want them to utilize the gift that you have given them to accomplish something. See, God has picked up an expensively high tab for your life. The price was too high for you just to waste it. That's why His expectations can be high. But on the same note, His rewards can even be greater. Rewards are losses. The range is wide. From raining to having everything burned up. Hebrews talks about these judgments being eternal. They will stand forever. See, what we do with this life determines where we spend eternity. The way we live this life will, be will determine how we spend eternity. Did you get that? What we do with this life determines where we spend eternity. 
The way we live this life will determine how we spend eternity. We will be examined. We will give an account of our words, our thoughts, our motives, our actions, and our intentions. I want you to know, in this life, you get a participation trophy. You will not get a participation trophy with God. He doesn't give you a trophy just because you sit in church every Sunday. I was there, God. I even put some money in the box. See, why are our deeds done in the body, the evidence in this courtroom? Two things. Our deeds will reveal who enters the age to come. And our deeds will be the measure of our reward in the age to come. See, our deeds are not the basis of our salvation. They are the evidence of our salvation. They are not the foundation. They are the demonstration of what God's done in us. So 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says it like this. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. What have you done with what you've been given? See, the greatest consequence of unfaithfulness here on earth is that, is on earth is that it disappoints Christ. Well, I thought I was about to say, no. See, He's already saved us. He's already sanctified us. He's set us apart. Now He says, listen, I want you to live your life pleasing to me. Not because I'm going to save you because of it, but because I am going to reward you because of it. How you live your life will determine that reward. In 1 John 2, 8, 2, 28, it says, Now, dear children, continue in Him, so that when He appears, we may be confident and unashamed before Him at His coming. He wants us to be pleased with Him. That's a sobering thought, that we could be ashamed when we stand before Him. I want to encourage you this morning, that He wants to lavish you with rewards as we live for Him faithfully. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, I'm going to read there just for a moment. He's talking about, Paul is talking about building. He says, the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Get this. By the grace God has given you, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one of you should build with care. We're builders. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, and straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. Yet be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Think about this. You're in your upstairs house. And all of a sudden, a fire breaks out on the first floor. Everything you own, everything you've saved, you've got your nest egg, you've got everything you have in the house. You have to jump out the window to save yourself. That's what he's talking about here. The losses. But it doesn't have to be that way. He said, how you live this life will determine how you live in eternity. Christ is the foundation, but what am I building? Am I advancing the kingdom? I have a choice on how I build on this foundation. This foundation was very expensive. God does not want some chief life, life set upon its expensive, His expensive foundation. This building will cost us something. It will cost some, some of us everything. What am I building with? I want to be up front and, and worship. Oh, so you want straw and hay. I want to pray in secret continually for the lost. Oh, you want silver. I want to raise my kids so that they truly love God. Oh, you want gold. What's the motive of our hearts? That's what he's going to check on. That's what we'll be judged on. He did not save you to sit in church, to sit, soak, and sour. 
God refers to us as builders and He's going to examine how we build the lives around us. So we have to build very carefully. How do you want to build this morning? I was thinking, I don't know why, the story just kept coming to my mind of the three little pigs. Straw house, the wood house, the brick house. God, I don't want to build a straw house that's not going to last. How I live this life is an interesting story. A woman, a rich woman went to heaven. And as she got there, she was looking around and all of her poor friends had nicer houses, mansions. She looks to St. Peter and says, what's going on? He says, listen, we, build, we built with what you sent us. What have you sent to heaven? What eternally are you living for? Gold, silver, and precious stones? I like the way Jeremiah says it like this. He says, he, he says, My word is like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. That fire of the word, the word is what we'll be judged by. And that fire will consume or it'll purify. Jesus said it like this in 1912 in Revelation. He says, his eyes are like a blazing fire. He will look at us. David had a, a dream a while back about this judgment of God. I know that as we were talking about it, I could feel it. I told him this morning, this is what God's talking about to us. He said, he goes, you know, I felt as though everything I ever done was exposed. When I was in his presence. He will be able to look through us. And see everything. How we spend this two fifths of a second will determine how we spend eternity. I need to invest in my internal retirement. Some would say, well, I don't want rewards. I don't need those incentives. But look at the Bible talks about it over and over again. Every apostle advises of rewards. And then we're too smart for them. Think about this in 1 Corinthians 9.24. He says, do you not know that, that in a race all runners run, but the one who gets the prize run in such a way to get the prize. 1 John 2.8 says, watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for but that you may be rewarded fully. God has a specific task for us. Jesus had a specific task. Did you know this? That Jesus didn't just drop onto the earth and know what he was supposed to do. He had to seek after the Father. And then God showed him. See, he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God has a specific task for you. It's like, remember when we were runners in high school and four laps around the track was a mile. The first lap was good. You felt good. You were making some progress. The second lap, little tuckered. The breathing was a little, little labored. The third lap, you're like, man, I don't know if I can keep going. See, that's what this life looks like at times. It's that third lap that gets us. It's not the first one. It's not the second one. It's in the, it's in the enduring run. It's in that third lap where we're like, God, I don't know if I can make it. Everything points us away from God. Christina said that last week. She goes, Craig, I don't understand it. It's as though everything in this life wants to pull us away. Everything is aimed to drag us in a different direction. See, I wanted you to understand this morning, some of you go, Well, Greg, you're sounding like you're talking about being saved by works. I'm not. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith that is not from yourself. It is a gift from God, not of works, so that any man can boast. And it's interesting to me that those who love to quote this scripture forget the very next scripture after it because he says then, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the very reason that you were saved. This is why you are here. This is your purpose. 
the distractions, everything will honestly try to pull us away. But we are here to run our race. You don't have to run my race. You don't have to run your wife's race. You are running your race. I've said it before. We get in our lane and we run our race. Hebrews 11.6 says he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Romans 8.18 says, I consider that these present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Some of you have had struggles. You've had a tough time. Life has been difficult. You've never been able to get ahead. You felt poor. You felt as though you cannot seem to make any headway. That's okay. He is storing up treasures for you. If you are living your life as unto him... Like that rich woman and those poor women. What are you sending to heaven? Reward or suffer loss. Live to please Him. Not just good intentions, but intentional living for God. Question. What are you called to do? I ask that question because... We won't be judged according to what we did in life, but rather what we were called to do in life. Imagine with me standing before the throne of God and a scenario like this occurred. Evangelist Anderson, come forth and give an account of your stewardship on earth. E evangelist Anderson, I, I'm not an evangelist, I, I, I'm an accountant. I, 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 I had an accounting firm, I had an evangelist Anderson. Where are the 347,566 souls I called you to impact in Asia, son? Where are they? I, I, I'm an, an accountant, I, I had an accounting firm. I, I, I help churches, I help ministries with their, their, their finances, son. Where are the 347,566 souls in Asia I called you to impact? Son, where are they? Had you sought me, had you sought my face, I would have revealed this to you. And everything in regards to that man's calling was burned up before the judgment seat. Accountant Jones, step forward and give an account of your stewardship. Uh, accountant Jones? No, I, I'm not. I passed it for 35 years. I, I, I had a, a membership of 750 people. Accountant Jones, I called you to the marketplace. Had you done this, you would have significantly impacted two people. You and those two men would have helped churches with their finances, and those churches would have impacted 751,321 souls. If you would have sought me, I, I would have revealed this to you. And again, in regards to this man's calling, everything he's done in life would be burned up before the judgment seat of Christ. Sister Smith, come forth and give an account of your stewardship. I, I only raised three children. I, I never preached to, to nations. I, I've never even been on a, a missionary trip. I, I only tried my hardest to raise my children in your way. Sister Smith, I never called you to preach to nations. I never called you to go to other countries on missionary trips. I called you to raise three children. And let me show you one million five hundred seventy nine thousand five hundred forty one souls those three children impacted you saw
assault me and you heard my voice, you were obedient to my call. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So remember, in regards to the calling that's on your life, you won't be judged according to what you did. You'll be judged according to what you were called to do.